Okay, welcome back. This is part two of vascular plants. And now we're going to cover the seed plants. All seed plants are vascular plants. Um, and I believe in this video, we'll just cover uh, the gymnosperms. And then I'll do part three of the video and cover angiosperms. All right, so here we go. Seed plants. Um, so again, seed plants are part of the vascular plants groups. All plants that produce seeds are also vascular plants. Um, and so remember the difference here are the seeds. So mosses and ferns we saw earlier reproduced by spores. And remember those are haploid cells and they disperse um, and they germinate to produce the gametophytes. So now spores will still be used in reproduction, but they are dispersed by seeds. Okay, and these are seeds are a very important adaptation for life on land. Okay, and so again, remember that spores are a single cell, while the seed then will contain the germination of that spore and um, contain the embryo. Alrighty, so seeds, um, I mentioned there, not only contain the embryo, um, but then they also contain uh, tissue that is nutrition for the embryo itself. And then all of that is contained inside of a protective coating. So that way, a seed can actually be dormant for quite a long period of time. I mean, we humans have exploited this to the, fact, to the point where we store seeds for long periods of time um, and then plant them when it's uh, appropriate to do so and also to save a food supply for the future. Okay, so in the picture here, um, uh, I just uh, blew it up for you. Here you can see they kind of cut away a seed and you can see that embryo inside. And again, that can stay dormant for a very long time, but then you see it's starting to germinate. So it's starting to produce the stem and uh, the roots um, and the leaves are going to start to penetrate through the other side. And over time, as the embryo is growing, the seed is reducing in size. And that's because uh, the seed is, again, contains tissues that can nourish the embryo. And so once the conditions are right, usually the seed has um, come into contact with moist, moist soil. It needs water then it will start to use the, uh, the nutrition inside of the seed and start to grow. And you can see the sporophyte there all the way over to the right. Um, uh, now almost not, it's got a green leaf, so it will be able to photosynthesize on its own and it won't need to um, use the, it's used up the nutrition basically in the seed, okay? So again, remember that seeds develop from the fertilized egg cell um, and that is developed from the female gametophyte. So we're gonna look at all those things and see how that works, okay? Um, and the other thing about seeds is that uh, the part that goes dormant is the embryo. So the organism is actually further along in development than a spore is. So it actually has a little bit more uh, successful chance of survival. Single-celled spores um, again, if they don't land on the right substance, then they'll just quickly die. But a seed can actually remain dormant until the environmental conditions are correct, um, until, uh, and then it will germinate. So uh, you can see that's a really good adaptation for plants to be able to move further away from water and tolerate more dry um, uh, system. So let's look at um, more characteristics of seed plants. Um, and there's a bunch of terms that you're going to need to understand. So um, remember with seed plants, we also saw in the earlier lecture that uh, plants now are starting to become more and more sporophyte dominant. And that's what's happening here. All the plants that we see and we recognize uh, trees, bushes, whatever, those are sporophytes. That you can refer to that as a sporophyte. Okay, the, the gametophyte, at least the female portion, is attached to the sporophyte and it's dependent on the sporophyte. And remember in some other earlier plants, 
um, it was free living. Okay. Um, the, the male will also be attached as well. Okay. And all seed plants are heterosporous. So again, hetero means, um, means different. And so uh, it, heterosporous means there are two different kinds of spores, so what we would equate to female and male, right? In the plants, we refer to those as microspores and megaspores. Okay, the microspores are going to be the sperm, the megaspores are going to be the egg. That's because sperm and all living creatures, they're much smaller than the egg. Sperm is, is mainly a package of DNA, you know, a haploid package of DNA, while uh, eggs, megaspores, are also a package of DNA, but they also contain the other cellular machinery, all those organelles and things. And so it contains the cellular machinery that the um, embryo is going to need in order to divide its cells, right? So here's some more terms. Um, uh, there's also, you'll see in these plants, ovules. So ovules are the megasporangia. So again, sporangia are, we learned in the past, were the organs that produce the spores. So megasporangio are the organs that produce the megaspores, right, which are the eggs. And so in plants, we usually call those ovules, okay? And we're gonna see all of this a little bit later. Um, whoops, I went back. I hit a button too soon. Um, so, uh, so again, so these, so the megasporangia are the ovules. Okay, they um, again, this is the tissue that makes the seeds or it makes the eggs, and then um, it has uh, an outer layer of integuments, right? Uh, tissues, layers of tissue, which kind of protect it. Then it's the later in development, it's the ovule that develops into the seed, okay? The integuments or that tissue develop into the seed coat. And again, that's what um, protects it. So um, we're gonna see, we're gonna look at two groups of, of seed plants. And the two groups are gymnosperms and angiosperms. And you can see that here. And again, these are, mainly the plants that you're used to seeing aside from the ferns and, and the others that we looked at. Okay, I think this is what most people are familiar with. Um, one more thing about seeds is I just wanna let you know, I could, I'm kinda in this slide covering the basics. Um, in a future lecture, we're actually gonna look at seeds in a lot more detail. All right, so let's, let's talk about Gymnosperms. So get used to the word gymnosperm. Um, again, it's a way to describe uh, a certain type of plant. And you're, you, you might be familiar with most of the ones that are referred to as conifers. So conifers are the plants that produce pine cones. So you can see the spruce trees in the picture here. Um, uh, if, if you, those who celebrate Christmas and you get a tree, that's a kind of, that's a Christmas tree pine trees, so you might be used to seeing all different types of conifers, okay? And gymnosperm, the term itself, means naked seed. And what that means is that the seeds are exposed on the scales of the, um, of the cone. And so at the top there, that's showing it's actually a female cone, because again, that's where the eggs will be located and once um, fertilization occurs then the seeds are formed and so uh, in the um, lower picture kind of the cross-sectional microscopic view again you can see at the bottom there where there's the megaspore that's the egg and then the ovule surrounding it and then the um, uh, the scales on the outside that th that's what will break off bringing the seed with it in order to uh, for a new plant to grow okay so seeds are exposed um, on the scales of the cones and i just saw a typo there that bugs me sorry scales s-c-a-l-e-s -E um, so there's four main four groups of gymnosperms uh, so we'll look at each one of these the conif coniferophyta ginkophyta cicatophyta and netophyta 
So these are different phyla. Again, you won't be responsible for those terms yet, but you should be, if you're not going to learn those terms, you should at least be familiar with the more common names, which you see in each of the four leaves at the bottom there. Conifers, ginkgos, cycads, and nettophytes. Again, at the end of the semester, we are gonna go through phylogeny and you will be responsible for these terms. So um, I just kind of get used to reading them now and understanding what they mean. And you'll do a lot better at the end of the, uh, at the end of the semester. Okay, so conifers. Conifers are probably the groups of trees um, and plants that you are the most familiar with. Again, pines, spruces, firs, you may have heard of hemlocks. There's actually 630 species of trees and shrubs in this group. And um, they're very woody, right? So this is what we associate uh, big stands of, of timber, of wood, right? And that's because of the tracheids. Remember the tracheids that we discussed uh, earlier in an earlier lecture? So tracheids are cells and they're just long and they're tapered. As you can see in this picture here so over to the left that's like a typical plant cell and that may be a tracheid that's actually cut in cross section in the middle it's a drawing of the tracheids you can see that they're long um, and they're tapered on the ends they're hollow in the middle and then there are um, uh, pores on the sides of them or pits that allow fluids to flow not only up and down the length of the tracheid, but also across into the neighboring tracheids. And so these just form big tubes where water passes through. All the way to the right, that's a microscopic view of what tracheids actually look like, a longitudinal section of that. Um, also, uh, Many of these trees produce resin, kind of that sticky substance. Um, you might uh, refer to it as sap, okay? And we can also see that, whoops, I actually didn't want to go there yet, I wanted to go here. In a cross section of the, of the trunk, you can see the uh, resin ducts that again, uh, flow, create, uh, are created through the length of the trunk so that the sap, um, runs the length of the trunk, okay? Uh, and then the megafills, remember that means leaves, um, true leaves, the megafills, they're actually needle-like. So these are not microfills, these are actually true megafills. And you can see different examples here of what the leaves look like. So they're more needle-like in appearance, okay? Just kind of reduced, but they're still have their green and they stay green year round. And so that means they photosynthesize year round, as opposed to other trees that we'll study later who that may drop their, tree, their leaves, um, especially in the colder latitudes. Uh, and so they are not uh, photosynthesizing at that time. So sometimes we refer to this group uh, of the conifers as evergreens, because they do stay um, green. Okay, uh, and then also have sporangia. So again, I always try to, because these terms are, we've got new terms, there's a lot of, um, a lot of them, you have to keep them straight. So remember, sporangia are the gamete producing organs. Gamete just means egg or sperm, okay? Um, uh, and so we will have in this group, megasporangia and microsporangia. So megasporangia is um, the fem what produces the egg, kind of the female gametophyte. And again, it's, it's associated with um, and dependent on the sporophyte. So megasporangia are um, um, associated with a cone, okay? So each cone scale has two ovules embedded in it. And so let me show you the close up here. And so here you can see um, the megasporangial or the, or the ovule on the surface, okay? Follow the, I'm not sure if you can see my needle pointing when I do this, um, but you can follow the lines there where the megasporangia is being pointed to. And again, 
the ovule is the same term as megasporangium. Okay, one megasporangium, many megasporangia. So there are me many megasporangia all up and down the length of that cone. Okay, and so within there, they produce two archegonia, right? That's the actual gametophyte, and it contains the egg. That's what's producing the egg inside of there, right at the base of that megasporangium. Um, and you can see that again in the close-up picture here, in that close-up. Right, the big round circle toward the left there. Okay, uh, so what will happen is that, and then at the bottom you can see the mature ovule, you see the two eggs in there, uh, the two ovules, I'm sorry, um, and the archegonium that's associated with it. So inside of the megasporocyte, right, meiosis will occur. So the megasporophyte starts with a diploid cell, it will divide by meiosis. Meiosis is the cell division that cuts the number of chromosomes in half. So it produces haploid megaspores. And what's interesting now, and we'll actually see this in the animal kingdom as well, um, in the megaspores, once uh, it, the way that it divides one cell will actually divide to produce four cells. But in the females, what'll happen is most of the um, nutrition and energy producing um, substances inside of the egg will all get transferred from three of the cells and just pack it into one. And so that's why only one megaspore becomes functional. Okay? The others just kind of dissolve away. And then again, the integument, you see that on the outer edge there, that integument, then this is a layer of cells over time, then as the seed matures, this becomes the seed coat. And that's what's going to protect the seed in the end. Okay, so that's megasporangia. Okay. We also have microsporangia, and microsporangia are associated with other cones found on the tree, um, and they're much smaller. So we, we tend to refer to them as stroboli. Both the female cones and the male cones are stroboli. Um, but oftentimes in general, we tend to call the female cones cones and the male cones stroboli. Okay? And you can see they're much smaller, uh, reduced in size. In fact, that this picture here, that's a cluster of several stroboli. That's not just one cone. That's actually a cluster of, of maybe 20 stroboli uh, together there, okay? Um, it's inside of the stroboli that contains the sporophylls, and these are leaf-like scales that bear the spores, right? So if you looked at stroboli closely, they do, they look like all these little scales on them. Um, so it's within there that um, the sporophylls are, well, those are sporophylls, the scale-like structures, and that's where the um, spores are being produced, okay? And so uh, two microsporangia contain microsporocytes, so we can see that here. The microsporocytes um, all along here, right? Within the microsporophylls, the microsporocytes are inside, and that's what contain, or that's what creates the microspores, which in general are called pollen. And this is what pollen looks like under the microscope for gymnosperms. They almost look like Mickey Mouse. The the two kind of uh, wings on the end, and it is wings because pollen, the way it gets dispersed away from the parent tree, is through wind. And so the pollen has developed these kind of wing-like structures on the, each end so that once the wind blows, this will get carried up into the wind and carried to another tree to an open female pine cone of another tree. Okay, that way, with sexual reproduction, you're getting a mixture of genes so that um, you can kind of mix up the combination of genes of um, uh, whether you get homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive. Again, within the population, that can, that, those different genotypes can be mixed up because 
a tree on one end of the forest can actually end up pollinating a tree over on the other side of the forest. Okay, but again, it's all wind driven, so it's pretty random. A lot of pollen can get wasted um, uh, because it's just random. The, the pollen has to travel through the wind and hopefully land on the megasporangia or the female cones. So if it does, then a, um, the pollen attaches to the this, this female cone is actually kind of sticky and um, the pollen then grows a pollen tube and it's an outgrowth from the pollen itself and it ends up digesting its way through the megasporangium to the egg within the archegonium. Okay, and then that's where the sperm inside of the pollen now can fertilize the egg. So now we're seeing a couple of different things happen here. We get pollination. So pollination is the process of pollen moving from one plant to the female portions of a different plant. Okay, once the pollination pollen sticks, that pollen tube grows and creates, digests its way down to the egg within the archegonium. When the pollen gets there, the sperm then uh, fertilizes the egg. So the second process is fertilization. It's a separate process from pollination. Okay, so the sperm entering the nucleus, getting into the cell of the egg and their nuclei fusing, that is uh, fertilization. And then we get a diploid cell. We get the zygote. Okay, so, um, so one thing to remember, just to keep straight what we've been tracking gametophytes, in this case, the germinated pollen grain with its pollen tube, that's the mature male gametophyte. So I might have misspoke earlier, the male gametophyte actually separates from the sporophyte, whereas the female gametophyte stays associated with the sporophyte. Okay. All right, that leads us to a life cycle, right? So plants, they all display the alternation of generations. I know you love this. Um, I'm trying to peek at you guys through the leaves. I know you love the alternation of generations. So we need to understand the life cycle of the gymnosperms and we'll use the um, conifers as an example, okay? Um, you don't have to worry about any of the other three plants that we'll go through. So again, the gametophyte phase is now dependent on the sporophyte and it's much more reduced, okay? Um, it doesn't last as long, whereas a sporophyte lasts uh, the entire life cycle, okay? And again, I already mentioned the difference between pollination and um, fertilization, so that's important to remember. So we can start with the big sporophyte at the bottom there, the pine tree, that is the mature sporophyte. Again, this figure is in your book. Um, and so, uh, the, um, there's gonna be their heterosporous, so they've got male cones and they've got female cones, okay? What's happening inside of both the male cones and the female cones, the cells are dividing by meiosis, so diploid cells are becoming haploid. And so uh, going up into the purple area now, the microsporocytes within the male cones are producing the haploid microspores right? And each of those will mature into a pollen grain. If we look over at step number three there, what's happening simultaneously, the megasporocytes within the female cones are undergoing meiosis as well, and they're forming the haploid megaspores. Okay, so the megaspores develop um, within the ovule, and that stays associated with the female cone. And what'll happen, again, those scales on the female cone will open up, and in the male cone, those scales will open up as well. And it says there, each scale will, um, uh, remember that's a sporophyll, each one bears two microsporangia, and so those will open up, releasing the pollen grains. And again, it's the wind that does that. Um, um, you might see sometimes a wind blow and you see all this dust coming out of the trees. 
that those are the pollen the pollen grains and again in gymnosperms you can tell a gymnosperm pollen by the little wings that they have on the end so that they can get carried further away by the wind that's an adaptation in order to take advantage of the wind so they fly and they get to the female cones usually on another tree okay? and then um, they grow that pollen tube and that pollen tube uh, digests its way to the megaspore or the egg and then the sperm now we're that's as the sperm penetrates the egg that's fertilization okay and now we're back to diploid because the egg and the sperm that are each haploid that means they come together and they produce a diploid zygote okay so the zygote now can um go dormant it become it divides it becomes the embryo as the seed is developing around it okay and then the seed can go dormant for quite a while usually what happens then uh one of the scales the scales on the mature female cones um they dry up and they uh, dissociate from the cone and again it has that wing on it so the wind can disperse it away from the parent plants and if it hits the ground in a suitable uh, environment, then the uh, seed will germinate. That means that the embryo inside, using the nutrition from the seed inside of it, protected by the seed coat, it starts to grow. And you'll start to see the stem and the leaves grow above and the roots growing below. And that's the alternation of generation of gymnosperms. So again, make sure that you can reproduce this. And again, not just reproduce it by memory, but explain what is happening. I wanna make sure you really understand how the alternation generation is similar in each of these groups that we looked at, but then their differences and how those differences are adaptations to the new environments that they're inhabiting. Alrighty, so those are our gymnosperms um let me show i don't know if i had a, i showed you this before but those are all female cones that you can see so i wanted to make sure that you saw what a female cone looks like all righty um the next group so those are our conifers the next group are ginkgos again we'll only use the conifers as a example for uh, alternation of generations or what we just call the life cycle um, so the rest, I just want you to see the um, characteristics of these plants that fall within the gymnosperms. So you can see they're very different. The ginkgos um, have more of a broad, flat leaf. Um, right now, there's only a single living species in the ginkgo phyta. Okay? Um, and these are ornamental trees. We actually have some on campus. So if we ever get back on campus again, you'll be able to see them. Um, there's some that are grown in planters in the cement area outside of the F building, um, uh, around F300, that area there. So the um, leaves are this beautiful fan shape. Um, and whoops, hit the button again. And um, they're dichotomously branched veins. So dichotomously means that they're, they're um, kind of forming two different pathways there. Um, and dichotomous means, um, well, actually we, we use the term later, di dioecious, is that um, there's actually gonna be female plants and male plants, okay? Um, so dichotomous, again, is these branching veins going off in the two different directions there. Um, the, um, uh, so the veins, again, are the, um, uh, water, the tracheids, and the phloem. So phloem, remember, is the structures to produce for uh, food, the sugars to travel through the leaves and get to the rest of the plant. So these ginkgos are often prized as ornamental plants because they're also very resistant to disease and pollution. So you usually see them planted in cities. They do really well. Um, the females produce the seeds and they're really fleshy and stinky. And so normally the plants that you see that are used um, 
uh, out in, in uh, cities and things like that, and even the trees on our campus are male because they don't produce the stinky, fleshy seeds. Um, it, they don't tend to produce cones as well. Again, they're dioecious, so they're, um, there are separate male and female plants. So if you have a ginkgo and you wonder why it's not reproducing, uh, it's because you probably only have one species, one, one uh, sex. You only have, if it's producing seeds, you only have the female. You've got to have a male plant. Okay, and then just like the conifers, the pollen that they produce are airborne. All right, those are our ginkgos. Cycads are really interesting plants. Um, we believe they are the most primitive or the earliest of the seed plants. Okay, um, they're usually found in tropical or subtropical biomes. The trunk is really short like that, a, a really squat trunk-like stem. Um, and then uh, the crown, these leaves kind of come out with these big compound leaves. So compound leaves are the, the separate little, they look like separate leaves there. That's actually one leaf that's branched off from, from the uh, petiole. Um, they look like palms, but they're not actually palms. They can be toxic. Um, birds like the seeds, but they're poisonous to humans. Okay, and it can just cause a slow degenerative brain disease. So don't, if you see a cycad, don't eat the seeds. And again, these are also dioecious. So there are different male plants and female plants. Okay, pretty interesting tree. So some people might have um, cycads uh, as ornamental plants too in their gardens. The netophyta, um, these are probably the closest living relatives to the flowering plants, which we're gonna discuss next. And here are some of the reasons. So the xylem, again, the xylem are the tubes to create that water and um, dissolve minerals flow through. So it not only has the cells called the tracheids that we saw before with the conifers, um, but they also have another type of cell that conducts water, and these are called vessel elements, and they're a little bit more efficient for water conduction. And so the reason, this is one of the reasons why we think this group is more closely related to the flowering plants, or what are called angiosperms, is because angiosperms also have both tracheids and vessel elements. Okay. Um, Actually, no, I think they only have vessel elements, not the tracheids. So you kind of see a little bit of a transition there. Okay. Um, and then they have clone cones that are kind of clustered together that resemble flowers. Um, and, and here are some pictures just to give you some idea of what different types of, um, of these plants look like. So you've got some desert plants. They're very odd looking plants. Um, and of course, this isn't showing any of the, uh, the cones associated with them. So netophytes. All right, so that pretty much does it for the gymnosperms. Again, make sure you understand just what the characteristics are for gymnosperms overall, and then the characteristics for each of these four groups. But you only really need to understand the cones and the alternation generations for the conifers. All right, that'll do it for this part. Um, I'm going to then, uh, the next video will be part three of vascular plants and we'll go over the angiosperms at that time.